Okay, uh, good evening everybody and a uh, very warm welcome to Cardiff School of Planning and Geography for uh, the continuation of our Innovation and Engagement Public Lecture Series. Hopefully you've all enjoyed a glass of wine before this evening's presentation. I just need to do some housekeeping. My name is Neil Harris, I'm one of the lecturers here in the School of Planning and Geography. Uh, just a little bit of housekeeping first. If there is a fire alarm, it's a real thing. Yep, and we gather outside in the cold, outside the Glamorgan building. Second, uh, if you do have a mobile phone with you, please turn it to silent, but don't necessarily turn it off because I've got a bit more information in a moment. Okay, so please make sure that they don't ring out loud. Um, this evening's uh, session is on the English housing crisis and the implications for planning and urban design. And I'll talk you through that this is a, this is a double act this evening. Yeah, so Professor John Punter and Dr. Bob Smith are doing a joint presentation. Uh, so it's a bit like a, to use a football analogy, it's a bit like a, a local derby this evening, yeah? Kind of a punter versus Smith. Uh, it's not quite as kind of confrontational as that. Um, John Punter uh, is our Professor of Urban Design in the school and last year, in 2014, uh, was awarded the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Urban Design Group, an amazing achievement reflecting John's kind of sustained academic and professional work in the field of urban design. And as part of that, he was invited to give the Kevin Lynch Memorial Lecture uh, at the Urban Design Group. And he focused on the topic that he's going to be talking about tonight. And we, when we knew that he was out and about around the country, giving you know, the benefit of his work to other parts of the UK, we thought, well, we'd like a little bit of that as well. So John is going to be providing us with his uh, a version, an adapted version, and uh, I must say, a much condensed version, yeah? <laughs> of his uh, Memorial Award lecture uh, that he gave. Um, but we felt that given that this focus on England, uh, as interesting as that is and kind of is you know, structurally very significant for the UK as a whole, um, we thought we'd pair John up with Bob Smith uh, to give us a little bit of context on the Welsh housing scene. So uh, John is going to be speaking for around 40 minutes and then Bob for around 10 minutes. And because they're both colleagues and not external visitors to the school, I can be a little bit rougher with them in keeping them to time. So hopefully we'll be uh, concluded the presentations by just before 7 p.m. And then we'll allow the usual 25 minutes, half an hour of questions at the end. Um, in thinking about questions as we go through, um, I think both speakers would like to take the questions at the end after they've both given their perspectives. Uh, so if we can hold back on our questions. When we do get to questions, what I will do is I will uh, try and structure it so that we cover th three different things, really. One is the, the general issues that John identifies about housing, uh, the supply of, under supply of, and the consequences of that. Maybe if we focus a little bit on the Welsh scene as well, and then if there is any uh, particularly local issues that people want to raise, then we'll structure our questions in that way. So I'll, I'll chair it at the end of the presentations in that form. Okay. I said uh, maybe don't turn your phones off. We are broadcasting live on YouTube this evening, people. Yeah, we are doing that. And uh, one of the things that our, uh, Carl, who kind of manages our program of public lectures, does, uh, he's, put, uh, he's linked us to a hashtag. So tonight's hashtag, yeah, for those that know what hashtags are, and hopefully it's everyone, it's house, hashtag housing crisis. So if you'd like to, uh, if you've got comments on tonight, then please use that, okay? Uh, I'm gonna leave it there and uh, hand over first to John. So if you can give our first speaker uh, of the evening a very warm welcome. I'll take my seat over there and we'll listen to John's presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Nice to be back um, temporarily and momentarily. Um, and particularly pleased to be sharing a platform with Bob. Thank you to Neil for the introduction uh, to my uh, closer colleagues. So I'm going to talk about the uh, English housing crisis tonight, um, which uh, nothing gets me more angry. Uh, so it will be even more impassioned than usual. Um, and also, of course, it is something that is changing day by day. And every morning when I pick up The Guardian and listen to Radio 4, something else is added and I have, end up annotating my slides. I'm going to look at the implications for planning and urban design. Uh, when I did it for the urban design group, I didn't think there wasn't very much urban design in it, in it really, because most of it is kind of social economic uh, discussion. But anyway, here goes. And I'm going to go very quickly because the PowerPoint's available for you to, to get uh, more detailed notes, etc. So uh, I'm going to cover five things. The English, English housing crisis, 
um, not the UK, the English housing crisis, the consequences of undersupply, the coalition's housing programmes, planning reforms, and the whole thrust of localism, that's the planning bit, um, the garden cities um, concept, and the way the coalition has put that forward as a possible solution, and particularly the Wolfs and Winners, because these, these Wolfs and Winner documents, which are on the website, are fantastic documentary evidence and really, really good for students. I really recommend those as, as something to look at in detail. Um, then I'm going to talk about the London housing strategy and its harsh realities, and um, we're going to get into the whole question of foreign ownership and things like that, which are very relevant. And then I'm going to look at some solutions, five recent reports which have come out on how to solve the housing crisis, most of which are incredibly radical. Uh, no prospect of any political um, support, but I think they are all fundamental. Two quotes, really. One from Peter Hetherington, you know, that we're a nation beset by growing social inequality and by an, in uh, an intensifying environmental crisis, but we seem to have forgotten how to think about and plan for our collective future. Uh, something that Peter Hall and Nick Falk and people like that have been saying uh, quite a bit. And then the, the other one, which comes from an urban designer, Urban designers are not at the core of the debate of national issues like housing shortage, green belt and garden cities. And that was in the journal uh, just before I decided what I was going to talk about. And I thought, right, that's definitely what I've got to talk about. Um, so uh, that's the rationale in a way for what I'm going to do. First of all, this diagram, which is truly shocking and truly frightening, really. Uh, and it's a key diagram. And it doesn't look any different if you did the whole of the UK. But this is actually the English data. Um, and it's the English housing crisis. And it's clearly evident uh, what a crisis uh, is looming because of the growth of council housing and the stopping of council housing production. Um, so that there is now um, no real production of council housing, sort of local authority owned. The social housing continues but hasn't grown in any way to compensate that. It's grown slightly but only in a, in a relatively marginal sense. And the private market, of course, which is very subject to uh, the cycles, economic cycles, uh, but of course has gone particularly down here at the moment. So three things to draw from that, really. Housing production is half what is needed, and the social supply is totally inadequate. So double whammy in that sense. Um, secondly, the point about house prices here. House prices have grown uh, dramatically, times six the house prices since um, even sort of 1975 or 1980, they've multiplied by six. But land prices have gone up 16 times. So that's a very important uh, figure, I think, because it shows the importance of land ownership, etc. Um, and then the, the, in, the, in this cost of land, housing land is something like 200 times agricultural value in London and 60 times uh, the uh, value of, of agricultural land uh, in Birmingham. So somebody's making a lot of money from uh, land on, rural land ownership. So when we look back at this, at this chart, you know, we need to sort of look at the governmental structure of that and what's actually happened. And we go back to Thatcher government. This was the government who stopped council house building and sold, all the, sto sold the stock through the right to buy mechanism and then introduced almost, almost four, five years later the buy-to-let provisions, which have meant a real boom in the rentier class, people buying houses to rent um, rather than to own. The Blair government, um, when it came in, didn't repeal or reverse those Thatcher policies, and that was its big mistake, I think. Um, what it did do was to pursue an urban renaissance, and that brought the brownfield element up to 77% of all housing was built on brown fields, which is a very positive uh, step forward. But they didn't really resolve the housing supply issue either. So housing supply lacked. When Gordon Brown came into government, he decided to tackle social housing investment, uh, and he did increase it. But, um, of course, the financial crisis intervened. And then the global recession, where we've seen very little happening, um, and then the uh, Cameron coalition 
which really has abolished the regional spatial strategies, the kind of national view of the need for housing. Um, and uh, what he has done, however, is to say local plans are more important and put that emphasis. So that's, I think, one negative and one uh, very positive element in, in their program. Uh, but now, of course, we've got a, a boom in private rental about to commence and help to buy um, for the middle classes, which are not resolving the, um, the affordability issue, of course. And all of this fits very nicely into David Harvey's idea of the neoliberal, uh, well, not David Harvey's idea, but David Harvey's written more about it in the urban context, about neoliberalism as deregulation, privatization, and um, the withdrawal of the state from social provision. So no council house building, uh, prioritization of, of the stock, deregulation in planning, uh, et cetera, uh, and in design as well. Uh, and that's really what's the process which is underpinning all of this. And then the key statistics which define the housing crisis. We have a huge shortfall, 243,000 we need, only 137,000 on per annum uh, being built between 2004 and 14. And part of that, of course, is because of the recession, but it's not entirely due to that. A long social housing waiting list to 1.7 million, 280,000 facing homelessness. This morning's paper had that figure. And then uh, 737,000 empty homes, of which there's no policy to get those houses filled or to, 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 uh, to plug that, uh, to, to bring those into, into active use. And underlying those two things, or expressions of those two things, a 71 to 65% fall in home ownership since 2003, and a 31 to 45% increase in private renting, particularly amongst the young, of course, um, those under 45, not, it's not that young, but in those where, as it was to be a kind of, uh, previously these people would have been buying, they are now, uh, of course, almost all renting. And of course, the average house price has gone up. It's now eight times the average income. It was four times the average income in 1994. So some very significant uh, changes over a relatively short per period of time has deepened the crisis. And also, when you look at the house builders' response, the house builders, of course, very susceptible to economic downturns. But what you notice in, in the supply curve is that they have not, uh, they're not increasing supply. They're decreasing it gradually because they're prioritizing the margins, the profitability, really, over volume. And that's a rational response, really, to this, uh, this cyclical nature of the housing market. But it's not helpful, of course, from our point of view. The private rental boom has been accompanied by a social housing decline. And again, I think that's very significant. Um, this kind of general figure, which we've used for years, about private rental, about 40% of income, social household income, social about 30%, and owner occupation, 20% of income, is a kind of a major statement about the, the advantages of, of, uh, of ownership, really, and the disadvantages of private rental. But those differentials are now really widening because the private rental sector has increased dramatically. Um, it's gone from up to 3.6 million. Um, 72% of the private rental is owned one, uh, one unit owned by one individual. So it's very much a, a response of the homeowning classes, really, to put their pension into uh, a buy-to-let uh, property. And that's very sensible because the returns on those, those rentals and the, t and the tax um, uh, benefits are very significant. So it's done very, it's done very well, and that explains why it's become so popular. But of course, increasing amount of private landlords, increasing, uh, decreasing uh, uh, amounts of social housing, means that the lower income groups have been are into the um, rental, increasingly into the rental market, and that's where the housing benefit uh, bill has has gone up significantly. So you can see that. Now, one-seventh of the total Social Security spending in the UK, in, in England, is, spent, is going to private landlords to supplement low-income households. 
uh, who are paying you know, rental averages of 40%. And you can see what has happened really is that the private rental sector has cream, is taking more and more of this uh, of the share, whereas the social housing uh, was, was fair, has been fairly static. Increasingly now, um, the housing benefit is going not to housing associations, but to private landlords. And that's a very significant change. So the implications for planning and urban design are all kind of basic characteristics of uh, the home of your own kind of thing. A sense of place, the bedrock of social continuity, uh, the tenure of housing, you know, that gives you a level of control, differing levels of control, how you can modify it, how you can depend on it. The size and adaptability of housing is critical to changing household composition and whether or not you have to move, etc. cetera, um, and all of those things. And of course, if we're building developments which uh, don't have social housing or don't have, quote, affordable housing, then we're becoming complicit in the general social uh, exclusion, which is becoming increasingly evident in the country. And one of the things that died a death, which was something that Thatcher, you know, emphasized to a tremendous extent, was this idea of a property-owning democracy. Well, I think that has, is fast disappearing. Um, and the question is, what, did it, was it, what is it that replaces it? It's something a lot more unstable, I think. Um, just to remind us that in uh, the 21st century, we have built uh, kind of e excellent housing, uh, but th this would not be, doesn't seem to be possible anymore. This is Southwark, um, very high density housing, 37% social rent. This is Cambridge, suburban, 30% uh, uh, social rent for housing, and of course, three hectares of open space. So just two examples of, of things that we got right, um, but things that don't seem to any longer be possible. This kind of quality, this kind of mix, um, and this kind of um, uh, exemplars, really. So what about the co coalition's policies? Uh, first of all, the um, the HCA. The, the, we don't have an HCA in Wales, and this is, this is very interesting, really. The HCA is a kind of executive agency, the old English partnerships, that will step in and look after the housing market and encourage housing development. Um, it's got 38 funding streams, so it's really complicated to try and make sense of it. But I think I just want to highlight a few things. Top of the list is the affordable housing bill. Uh, reservoir of funds, 4.7 billion. Um, it's ownership and rental now, not just rental, but ownership and rental. But it's a misnomer. Affordable has changed its meaning. I'll come on to how it's changed the meaning in a moment. It, it's no longer affordable. The second biggest change is huge investment going into build to rent. So what the government is trying to do is to bring major pension funds and major uh, insurance companies and people like that in to provide purpose-built rental accommodation uh, with high levels of, of debt guarantees uh, and perhaps better tenant protection rules. Uh, we certainly hope so. And then one billion for site, large site infrastructure projects, things like uh, where the infrastructure the connectivity is a particular problem. Um, small builders fund for small schemes, um, local infrastructure plans for, for just for making the project a little bit more profitable, taking it into, um, into the black, so to speak, and then small housing zones and things like that. So some very, um, the, the, the big thing is affordable housing, but not affordable, build to rent, uh, which is very significant. Um, but of course, while the HCA is supporting housing, we've got two things going on which are disrupting it very significantly, the reduction in housing association grants and uh, the bedroom tax, which has already evicted or pen penalized half a million people, uh, two thirds of which are disabled. So that's had a very negative effect, particularly on uh, the social housing uh, arena. And then planning initiatives. Well, in some ways, all the government has done is to condense the uh, planning advice, and a lot of people have welcomed this, um, but of course it makes academics a bit, a bit more redundant because you can get it all into 50 pages. Uh, you don't need a, a whole course on it. 
Um, so we struggle a little bit perhaps with that. But um, the MPPF has got, it's largely uncontroversial, but the devil is in the detail. And uh, particularly come to that towards the end of this slide. They've put more emphasis on plans, um, making them up to date, getting them adopted. Um, and if development accords with the plan, then you must approve it. But still, only 57% of plans are adopted. And some of the, many of those are not MPPF compliant, as they should be. So that's, that is still a problem, uh, still, still a, a something to be resolved. The abolition of regional strategies and its replacement by kind of, instead of a top-down mechanism which said to, you know, a city region, this is where we want your housing to go and this is how much you, know, you need to collectively provide, now it's merely a duty to cooperate. And it's no surprise, really, that the duty to cooperate is very difficult to operationalize between rural areas and urban areas. And, of course, the boundaries of urban areas are all, almost all too tightly tied to allow reasonable expansion and growth. The core planning principles are the same, but economic development takes priority. That is, it's not stated like that, but that is the, that is the reality. Um, and the... Uh, community infrastructure levy, which is part of this, um, a, a key part of it really, um, only 61% of over 300 local planning authorities have actually got a community infrastructure levy so that they can find money for um, infrastructure, affordable housing plus, of course, um, roads, uh, transit uh, and community centres and things like that. Um, so that's a, a big a big question mark. And of course, there's something else happening, which is the viability tests for uh, CIL are becoming more and more stringent. The developers are getting 20%, but then they're also making these very difficult to understand and trying to argue that they're private matters and things like that. So there's a big, big battle going on here. Added to that, of course, the coalition's big emphasis on neighborhood plans, um, localism, uh, the small neighborhood plans, um, I mean, I'm going to offend at least one person in the room here. Um, it, these are something of a distraction in terms of the, uh, the, the provision of housing uh, from, from the local authorities' point of view. So there aren't many incentives in terms of housing, but one of the key ones is you get a new homes bonus, six years council tax for every house you build. So that's, it's significant, but it doesn't seem to have really driven much action. Um, the change, the key change, is that it talks a lot about inclusive communities. But what has happened, and this is the most important thing, is that affordable, whereas it was 30%, and that's the norm we, we thought of in terms of social rent, that now can go up to 80% of market rents. So there's a tremendous change at that point, and essentially making more commercial rents. So those are the things really which um, are very, uh, very significant. And then uh, just before Christmas in the quiet period, the, uh, they changed the rules on uh, CIL contributions. So uh, if you're refurbishing an empty building, you don't have to pay uh, any uh, CIL. And I think there's roughly 100 million in Westminster alone riding on four planning applications which could be lost to affordable housing in one of the second richest boroughs in, in central London. So really, really problematic. The final thing is the Garden Cities prospectus, uh, which is, wasn't in the MPPF, but which is important because this is very much uh, government policy pickles and um, driven with, um, the, uh, with Clegg and co. Uh, but kind of a particular notion of garden cities, which we'll come to in a moment. In terms of design, I think I'm going to skip this because all you really need to know is that the design aspects have been gradually watered down, highly condensed, um, no longer indicators, but simply advice. Uh, the quality reviewer has gone to one page where it was a 60, uh, sorry, 70 page document by uh, Rob Cowan, now a one page form. Um, and, of course, CABE has disappeared, so we don't get good monitoring, we don't get good critique, we don't get a good um, uh, analysis, and its replacement by the Farrell Review, I think, has been one of the great uh, disasters. And, of course, the other thing that's happened is the 
cuts in local government, 25% so far, another 25% to come in uh, by 2018. That has made a crisis in staffing and design is something that's really suffered from that. So that brings me on to the, the Garden Cities Initiative and the Wolfson Economic Prize winners. And here, I thought, was something that really um, <coughs> transformed the picture, if you like. Uh, the government had asked for Garden Cities. Here was the e Wolfson uh, Group, Economics Group, saying, right, let's, let's look at what's possible. Um, and they came up with this uh, competition with a quarter of a million pounds for the winner, which is you know, a significant sum of money. And the winner was you know, on how to deliver a garden city, which is visionary, economically viable, and popular. Uh, so uh, not important economics and important um, about the visionary nature. One by David Rudlin, um, with a lot of help from Nick Falk of Urbed, um, with three suburban extensions, each of five neighborhoods, added to a freestanding town. And the key thing that Rudlin did was to say, right, what about the land? How do I get land at a reasonable price to allow me to build something of design quality, of visionary quality, uh, and make it economically viable? So he chose to take a figure of 20 times agricultural value or 15% of the current development value. So these are two kind of things to impress in. To, to really um, impress upon yourselves about the difference between uh, the private, the market as in land and the reality. And this model is taken from Germany, really. Germany has this roughly these sorts of figures for things in its development plans. Um, a garden city trust, of course, to have a kind of communal management and part, much more participative uh, form of government and investment. Um, and what Rudlin decided to do was to graft this, these garden, cit this garden cities or garden suburbs or sustainable urban extensions onto an existing city. And everybody thought this was terrific, except the Minister of Housing, who the following day said, uh, I'm totally against it because it, it, we're committed to protecting the green belt and um, we're against urban sprawl. So all of the work that had been done was really uh, thrown out of the window uh, by, by the government. This is the Rudlin proposal. It's an existing town of about 200,000 people. It's growing at about 1% per annum. And all that Rudlin was saying, well, let's make it grow twice as fast, 2% per annum. So a really steady rate of growth. Um, so perhaps twice the current rate. But here are the five neighborhoods. This is, you know, one two, three, they're, they're attached to the arterial roads, they're connected by bus rapid transit, they've got a density gradient, they have their own green belts, which of course the minister failed to notice. These are accessible green belts within an overall uh, green frame. Um, and this idea of avoiding new town blues and things like that by growing onto an existing city. And many of these ideas were developed in their work on Oxford, which I will show you uh, in a moment. But this is the, the winning project. This is the runner-up, which in some ways um, I thought was somewhat better, but perhaps because of these two things. First of all, it's denser. Um, the Rudlin proposal goes from 25 to 65, but the um, shelter proposal um, goes uh, for a 60 dwelling per, uh, dwellings per hectare net density, so quite dense. 38% affordable, there's no mention of affordability in the Rudlin proposal. There's a big emphasis on prefabrication and self-build. Um, extensive green infrastructure, but of course it's being built out on open marshland, uh, etc. in the uh, Thames, south side of the Thames Estuary in North, North Kent. This is Rochester, Gillingham and Co. Uh, and this is the railway which currently exists. This is the King's North uh, power station. So it's quite a lot already going on there. And the emphasis here is upon dense, um, affordable, um, green, uh, patient money, a strong garden city trust, sharing um, returns with the council, with the landowners, 
with residents, shareholders, and with housing associations. So building a kind of coalition. This is the project up close. It has strong Dutch overtones to me. Probably that's just the factor of the floating, um, uh, floating residential, but it's uh, the waterfront location. It's much denser and compact and set within the green frame. Uh, so this was, this was another one which doesn't get much mention, but which I think, again, is really worth studying in some detail. Two of the other proposals uh, focused upon the question of a national spatial plan. Can we actually put garden cities, start putting garden cities everywhere? Should we be carefully planning this? And the Barton Wilmore, which is a private consultancy, saying we need to have a spatial plan to really plan where these garden cities might go and preferably put them within the orbit of an existing urban area uh, to have some kind of relationship with, with the mother city, so to speak. So in that sense, they share the idea with Rudlin. And you can see this dark green is outside, light green is inside as a possible uh, spatial plan. The Waiyang Bureau Happold project went for this um, sort of 60, 65 mile radius of, Lon of London with from uh, Southampton to Felixstowe through um, Cambridge, Oxford, and uh, Bedford and Milton Keynes. Um, and it's interesting that shortly afterwards, Nick Clegg came out with the idea of five garden cities between Oxford and Cambridge. I think he needs to look a little bit closer at the map because it's pretty congested, really, uh, in this area here. Um, and there may not be room for that kind of thing. But anyway, at least it was a, a positive step forward. And interestingly, interesting, I'm glad, I'm sad that the Civic Society is not here tonight because the Civic Society in Oxford have done a tremendous job with, with, with analyzing the problem in Oxford. The problem of the extensive green belt, the problem of housing shortage, congestion and pollution, um, the need for um, co consensus, the need to develop consensus in a garden city proposal and how to take those recommendations forward. And this is moving not into a garden city idea, although Bicester is a garden city, and there might be garden cities connected in with that, uh, with that idea and proposal. But this is where F Rudlin and Falk got many of their ideas, and it's a very not interesting brochure about a community trying to do that for itself um, and pointing out the problems that exist. One of those problems, of course, is the Oxford Greenbelt, which is totally constricting in terms of development and that's something that I want to mention in this context, context of garden cities, because um, the green belt began as a quarter mile wide, it's now 35 miles wide around London, it is becoming absurd um, and the policy has been restated, the green belt should only be altered in exceptional circumstances which does not include unmet housing demand. That was Pickle's immediate, immediate response uh, again. So it's putting you know, the green belt as absolute. And the green belt, of course, is 13% of Britain, which is more than the urban area of Britain. Uh, so there's that nice imbalance. This is a Centre for Cities um, proposal for green belt locations uh, related to transit, etc. So the sacred cow of green belt really uh, is one of those things that really needs to be addressed. The London housing strategy. Um, this is really where the rubber hits the road, so to speak, and where things become truly interesting, complex, and insoluble. 42,000 homes per annum. It, you know, the good thing is that London has developed a strategy with the, uh, the 26 boroughs. Uh, Going to build 42,000 homes a year, the demand is reckoned to be up to 62,000, so there could be problems. But already, look at the gap between the 42,000 and the existing. So, and of course, the existing has no council component. It has a small housing association and a larger private. So of this 42,000, you know, we're going to see quite a significant affordable component, but it's not affordable as you know it, Jim. You know, it is uh, something different. It's something quite a lot more expensive. So there's half of it, it roughly, is, is, is owner-occupied. Uh, private rental will take 5,000, and the rest will be, a share, will be ownership or uh, intermediate housing. 
And here are the statistics, uh, the graphs which should show the problem. The decline of social rent, the rise of private rental, the, de the decline of, of overcrowding in social rental, the increase in, private, in uh, overcrowding in private rental. So two uh, problems uh, there really, uh, two obvious problems. And then this one about the decline of social rent. And this would look a lot worse were it not for the Olympic Village, which is sort of more or less this, this amount here uh, in terms of a one-off uh, provision of social housing. So real problems. And then the how, where, do, where does this housing go? Well, most of it, a very significant element of it, is going into the poorer inner London boroughs, ones with Lambeth, particularly Southwark, Tower Hamlets, um, Newham, uh, and Greenwich. And here are the figures. The figures of 4,000 houses, 3.9 thousand houses a year uh, is dramatic. And of course, much of this is going to go into high-rise housing uh, above 20 stories, inevitably. So it's a very, um, a very interesting picture, a very pressured situation. The affordable housing situation um, is even more problematic. Um, because the average affordable is 69% of market rents, not 30%. That's what's been achieved so far. And we see it here in the, in the Mount Pleasant Royal Mail development where the mayor intervened and said, um, we're going to approve this development with only 14% affordable rent, 9% shared ownership, um, and we're going to ignore the borough's policies of 50% affordable. Uh, so here was a, obviously a privatization project where um, the uh, mayor uh, took a tremendous step into the, into the battle, really. And what happened, of course, was that when you look at the, the affordability, this requires rents of 55 to 80,000 pounds, which is not exactly low income. Uh, it's very much middle income in the London context. And I think this is one of the thing, another thing you need to engrave on your hearts, in a sense. We always need to know what the proportion of social rent is um, and the, the real costs of intermediate and shared ownership because they are dramatically different from what we've been uh, subjected to so far. So when we look at the major development sites, Earl's Court, for example, 11% affordable. They're demolishing uh, a large number of social units, but they are rebuilding those but they're only building 740 intermediate rent in Earl's Court. So it's a lovely development, Terry Farrell and co, but it's a very uh, socially exclusive one. Boxall Battersea, this is where the uh, towers are really impacting uh, dramatically. This is Battersea Power Station, which is largely Malaysian uh, f um, in terms of its, its marketing, etc. cetera. Um, and overall, there's less than 20% affordable in this area. Uh, the US Embassy is here, so obviously the apartments around that uh, are likely to be very, very high end. But each of the projects, the Foster and Geary project, um, which are obviously signature projects, again, quite a low uh, 15 and to 10% uh, uh, affordability. And those sorts of projects in the London opportunity areas uh, don't bode very well for social rent. In fact, they see it almost completely excluded. But there's also an estate regeneration program, which is really hammering the social uh, housing network um, and major se uh, social equity uh, issues. Woodbury Down, for example, in the London Borough of Hackney, um, this was a very long controversy. It's gone back to the Labour Party, but this is what uh, has been happening here. We've now um, uh, got a new master plan the social rent level has fallen from 100% to 20%, but with 21% intermediate rent. So it's not, it's not a like for like. And the other problem which emerges here, 55% of the housing sold to Southeast Asians, uh, in, mainly in Singapore, where of course Singaporeans uh, can't own housing. It's all public housing in Singapore. Uh, so this is the kind of thing, that just, it's a kind of state-led, gentrification process. So this is the estate which is progressively being demolished uh, to be replaced by um, a, very, a very much improved environment 
but of course one in which um, the, uh, there's far fewer social housing units uh, and the mix is definitely high end. The quality of urban design, of course, is significantly better. This is the piece de resistance, the, the really significant case. This is the London Borough of Southwark, where what mo most people consider to be a monstrous kind of social housing project has been demolished. But the 1,200 council houses have been replaced by 79 social and 500 affordable rent. So this is dramatic change. And the, bor the borough spent 65 million decanting tenants. And then Lend Lease only paid 55 million pounds for the site. So there's something very odd going on. And the viability assessment about the amount they're going to pay for infrastructure has been challenged. Lend Lease said it's a private matter. When it went to court, he said, of course, it's not a private matter. Uh, but it's typical of the problems that councils have in terms of trying to decide what is fair. And this is a map of the displacement of leaseholders in, in the Haygate. Um, and of course, it's clearly social cleansing. These people are moving way out into the outer suburbs of London. So the London housing strategy in the balance, there are some positives, uh, particularly in the design arena, but the affordability targets um, and the council estate refurbishment and the boom in high-rise apartments for investors, not necessarily for users, is particularly worrying, I think. Um, the GLA says pre-sales will enhance development viability and make each of these projects feasible. Well, that's true, but of course the question is, will they ever be, um, will they ever come into occupation by Londoners or uh, will actually overseas people live here? This is a recent piece of analysis by Molia Consultants and this is the, this is Earl's Court, this is, um, sorry, this is Earl's Court, this is Westfield area, this is um, Vauxhall, this is uh, Southwark, this is Greenwich, here Greenwich Millennium Village. We've got something like 37,000 uh, apartments in, in the pipeline. They're very expensive. Um, a lot of them have been bought by city people with their bonuses, but the level of overseas ownership is very high. And what has happening, been happening against the rules is that they've been marketed first abroad and not, uh, only latterly in, in the UK. So the possible solutions, um, quickly through these. I'm running how much over time? <laughs> I've got another four or five minutes, have I? Okay. Right. Oh, this is very rare. What a luxury. Right. Um, and what I've done for possible solutions is I've distilled um, the whole folk, the whole book on um, the European examples, why, why we should follow Europe. The Lyons Report, which mysteriously is a Labour Party document which we haven't seen, haven't had publicised yet, although I've read it. The KPMG Shelter Report, which is brilliant because it's got this kind of twin um, financial strength with social commitment. National Housing Federation, housing, the Housing Associations, and the Centre for Cities, which is a good think tank. And I put these together. Uh, they're all worth reading if you're interested in housing. They're brilliant documents by and large, particularly these two, because they're so detailed. This one's more on planning. This one is more on, on housing. But together, they, they, these make a very powerful set of things. So the, if you looked at the Falk um, and Hall book, as Neil's done, for example, for, his, for some of his stuff, um, you will see that they're recommending the kind of Swedish stroke, uh, German stroke, um, Dutch approach. And I've chosen the Dutch example, Netherlands Vinex, because this is where we go on field trips when we're looking for big projects that uh, are, are of good quality. Um, and here we've seen 455,000 houses built in sustainable urban extensions in a nine-year period. Uh, in, a, in a country which is how, what size in, t in relation to Britain? Whereas a third, thank you, yeah. So, you know, it's a very significant number. 30% is affordable, dwelling densities between 30 and 60. Municipal land ownership and master planning. Municipal bank funds the infrastructure. There's immediate transit links that, and the planning takes place integrally with water 
and integral land management, green spaces as well. There's a multidisciplinary team and public-private partnership with developers, but of course the local authority is essentially in control. And urban design housing quality is very high and it's 40% cheaper than what we produce in the UK. So, you know, this is Epenberg, large series of, of subdivisions. This is uh, Eiberg, the centre of Eiberg, which is high density, mix of um, social housing and, and, and private housing. This is Steiger Island, which is lots of small projects, custom build, self build, um, small housing associations, a tremendous diversity, but built to a, an overall master plan. Um, and so, you know, the Netherlands provides us with one of those examples, with one of the best examples. But you could choose Freiburg, you could choose Malmo, uh, you know, or uh, uh, Stockholm and provide similar things. What I've done with the four British reports is to put them in order of recommendations. I've got 12 or 13 recommendations. Four stars means all four of them said the same thing. Okay, so there's a tremendous consensus there. And the first of those is lower raw land prices with the betterment reclaimed to pay for all infrastructure and affordable housing and community costs. Those of you who are as old as me will remember, well, I don't even remember, it's before my time. In 1947, we introduced betterment. In 1951, it was taken away. You can't have planning without a land policy. That's something which is really important and has really come home to roost. So we've got to lower land prices. We've got to reclaim the betterment for infrastructure and things like that. Secondly, we've got to prioritise local plan adoption. We've already seen the Tories doing that. And housing growth area allocations, working between city and rural interlands. Uh, and that needs more than a duty to cooperate. It needs some real collaboration. Uh, and it also needs enhanced finance and development powers for local authorities. And we, what I suggest and what others suggest is increase the town council house, the council tax bans to tax housing wealth as a major source of that. But also in, improve the instruments, um, also um, develop sub-regional infrastructure funds uh, from central government. And then Housing Investment Bank, which is a Dutch idea to support housing associations in particular, and the notion that you can actually take that kind of support out of the deficit, the, the deficit, which kind of colours everything we do, and uh, avoid that uh, because it's a infra positive infrastructure investment. A redefinition of affordable housing, I put back to social rent norms. That's a bit utopian, but certainly below 69%, which is what we're seeing in London. Garden cities, yes, but new and expanded towns as well. You know, we really should be revising uh, that kind of idea. Uh, the revitalization of small builders to increase diversify supply, but not allowing them to get away with no affordability and no energy efficiency, which is what's uh, happening under current rules. And this is really important for rural areas, this particular uh, element. And then taking on the green belts and reinforcing their positive environmental role, but developing areas which are very accessible. Um, and then the others are kind of things that I've um, uh, believed in or I've seen very strongly emphasized elsewhere in the reports. Reforming tenant security, fair rent provision in private rental, getting rid of uh, revenge evictions and things like that. Um, raising design, space, energy and efficiency standards. You know, one of the good things that Boris did was to increase the size of housing in London by 10% over Parker Morris. So a double, a double plus there really to, to Boris for doing that. Um, reduce, trying to reduce housing benefit subsidies so we have more money for social housing. And then number 12, end the right to buy from council houses and disincentivize buy to let. Two quite controversial things um, because one knows, we know, one knows who owns 20, 30, 200, 800 uh, buy to let properties and, and what profits they're making. And we know council estates have been ravaged by uh, the buy to let strategy. It's a very challenging but fundamentally necessary series of reforms to prevent increasing social disparities and dysfunctional urbanism. The two things go together, really. And secondly, uh, it's based really upon this key problem, which you would have heard from uh, uh, people already, 
uh, and particularly Andrew Sayer, about wealth inequality, Thomas Piketty, um, David Harvey and co. Wealth inequality, especially housing wealth, has been widening since 1979 and reducing, and it will require great political, reducing it will require huge political will. And so these are very big political issues and the barriers are very considerable. But a man might dream. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you very much, John, for keeping very roughly to time. Roughly. <laughs> <laughs> please, please, we still keep the 10 minutes that we promised Bob that you would have to look at the Welsh Housing Administration and a quick analysis of that gives a bit of a uh, national uh, flavour. Uh, so, Bob, about 10 minutes, and then we'll still be on stable for our uh, starting our discussion at around 7 o'clock. Thanks, Neil, and thanks, John. I mean, that was a real tour de force, I think, of the, uh, the English housing crisis. When, just before Christmas, John asked me if I would sort of uh, do a, uh, a quick analysis and, and response of the, uh, the Welsh housing situation, I, uh, I agreed and it's a delight to, to share a platform with, with John. Um, I'm neither a planner nor an urban designer, so my, my sort of analysis and response will be probably broader and, and less um, specific to issues around land use planning and design. But I do want to just very briefly look at some of the areas where there are, I think, common issues between uh, Wales and England, but also some of the areas where um, <coughs> the Welsh Government and Welsh local authorities have perhaps responded differently. Clearly there are common problems, but the severity of the problems in Wales, thank goodness, is not as great as, as outlined by John in relation to parts of England, particularly to parts of South East England and um, the, the Greater London area. Bob, can I remind you to use the mic for the people who are next door, if that's possible? Yes, of course. So, yes, I forgot to John was, um, was mic'd up. <laughs> Thank you. What I want to do in, in the ten minutes briefly is just to, to look at what I see as the, the key challenges for, for Wales. First of all, there is the numbers game. Does Wales have enough homes? And are they in the right places and are they affordable? I want to look at the backlog of need for affordable non-market housing. I want to look at how um, supply might or might not keep pace with the rate of projected demographic change in, in Wales over the next 20 to 30 years. I'll briefly touch upon issues around the quality of, of housing, around the design, the build and the maintenance of the, the housing stock and equally briefly probably deal with some of the issues around land availability, planning, the construction industry. And I want to look at issues around housing affordability and um, the problem of attracting sufficient investment into to housing in order to increase the supply of both market and non-market housing. And obviously briefly to touch upon the, the differences at the sort of spatial level in terms of housing demand and need supply and of course the skills that are required uh, to address some of these some of these challenges. Just to present you very briefly with the, uh, the context in terms of, of numbers, Wales we're talking about a stock of just under 1.4 million dwellings. Um, home ownership is higher relatively um, in, in Wales than in England, but as in England it's been in modest decline over recent years. The social rented sector, relatively small, um, and uh, again, I think the, 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 the chart there shows how the local authority sector has declined very, very significantly. It's now only 6% of the, the stock in Wales, partly substantially, I suppose, as a result of um, sales under the right to buy, the lack of building that John talked about in relation to England, and also the transfer of council housing stock in half the work of the parties to, to housing associations, partly explain the growth of the housing associations, and the big growth, the, uh, uh, the, the purple sector, where the private rented sector in Wales has doubled um, in size in the last uh, 10 to 12 years, I suppose, have gone from 7% to 14%. Uh, what do 
do we know about the, the backlog? Well, back in 2010, academics at Cambridge University <coughs> suggested there was a backlog of need um, from about 9,500 households across Wales for non-market affordable housing, people living in overcrowded conditions, people who have been voluntarily sharing, homeless households in temporary accommodation. In addition, there were roughly 8,700 8, households living in overcrowded accommodation in the social rented sector. Uh, and to be honest, I don't think the, um, the, the bedroom tax or the surplus room um, subsidy has actually helped to address that issue. Has the situation worsened since 2010 in Wales? Well, we don't know, but I suspect all the indicators around homelessness, around involuntary sharing, around overcrowding would suggest they have. And clearly we need to link that, that backlog to the future household projections, how are things going to change over the next 10 to 20 years, and what will that mean for the requirement for both market and non-market housing. Um, the, the work that I referred to, done by Alan Holmans and Sarah Monk at Cambridge University in 2010, is being updated at the moment. Um, it's been commissioned through the Public Policy Institute for Wales, and uh, the report is with civil servants and the ministers, and we'll have an update on the figures, hopefully, uh, in the spring. And clearly that will have big implications for public policy, investment decisions, planning decisions, and housing strategies and policies at different scales in Wales over the coming period. Are we keeping pace with demographic change in terms of the supply of housing? Well, again, to give you some basic facts, I suppose, the population in Wales is projected to grow by about 8% over the next 20 years or so, between 2011 and 2036. But the number of households is going to grow by almost double that, around about 15%, an average household growth of about 7,600 additional households each year. Now, try and keep that uh, in your mind when we look at the, sort of the figures for supply of new housing in recent years, and particularly since the, um, the, the financial crisis and the economic uh, recession. And those figures are lower than the ones that fed into the Holmans and Monk Review in, in 2010. There are also big variations across the 22 local authorities. So if, um, if one looks at the individual authorities, then in places like Cardiff, uh, you'll see that um, the projected growth is in excess of 40%, um, certainly over, uh, over the period to 2036. In some of the other Welsh cities, Swansea, Newport, Wrexham, it's rolling at between 20 and 30%. But in some parts of Wales, very little uh, growth, I think, in Anglesey or in, in Blyna Grant. The projected increase in households is, um, is, is very, very small indeed over the, 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 the planned period. How has Wales done in terms of housing supply? Well, in the 10 years from 2001 to 2011, you see there, just under 80,000 additional homes, both in the market and non-market sectors, were, were provided. And my maths tells me that's just under 8,000 a year on average. You know, the, the graph shows you that the big drop from around about 2007-8, um, so that completions both in terms of market housing, housing primarily built for private occupation or private renting, plummeted. Um, and the social rented sector hasn't been able to plug the gap either. You can also see, possibly, the, um, the green at the top of all of those uh, uh, bar charts, um, which is the provision of additional housing by local authorities um, since 2001, which has been almost non-existent um, in Wales as in, in England. What's the evidence that we have in Wales about what the balance of um, housing provision should be. Well, again, to go back to the evidence that um, researchers at Cambridge produced in 2010, they recommended um, that, well, they estimated that there was a need for something like 284,000 additional homes over a 20 year period. So that's just over 14,000 a year compared with John's 243,000, I think, for England. As you expect, the 
figures are much lower. And they broke the figures down, recommending about just over 9,000 in the market sector and about just over 5,000 in the non-market affordable sector. So about two-thirds of a third. Um, the affordability problem, it's still significant in some areas of, of Wales um, in relation to um, local incomes, but it probably has got um, less of a problem than it was in the, uh, in the middle of the, 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 the last decade. As I say, these overall estimates will no doubt be revised down when we have the, um, the updated figures from Cambridge University, but they will still be, my guess, um, substantially ahead of what, um, what we are currently providing in terms of new supply. If I can very quickly say something about investment and affordability. I mean, immediately, in the immediate period post the evolution, I think Wales did lag behind England and Scotland in investing in housing. That picked up to some extent around about 2007, 2008, and things have improved in terms of public spending on, on, on housing in Wales in the period since. Uh, many of the problems around shortfalls of housing supply and affordability were identified in a report that uh, Sue Essex, who sat here in the audience, led uh, in that period and, and identified, I think, the problems uh, of long-run supply shortages. Um, as well, we've had an additional report published a year ago from the Ministerial Housing Supply Task Force that um, provided further analysis of the problems in Wales and suggested a whole raft of actions. Despite the cuts in uh, UK spending, and clearly other spending priorities within the world context, uh, money has been found for additional investment in the supply of, uh, of extra affordable housing. I'd just like to highlight some of the initiatives that have been taken in, in Wales. We've had um, investment into a national um, empty property initiative. John said there hasn't been any equivalent at national level in England. We've had money going into the Housing to Home scheme. Indeed, this week the current minister announced extra money going into that scheme to bring back into use um, empty homes in the private sector. Uh, Leslie Griffiths, the current minister, also announced this week extra money for home improvement loan schemes to try and invest in improving the, the quality of some of the older housing stock. We've had support from the Welsh Government for small builders to help them to fund development. And we've had our own help to buy scheme, as well as participating in the UK-wide mortgage guarantee scheme. And again, the evidence from the Welsh help to buy scheme is that it is primarily um, reaching first-time buyers. Something like 70%, I think, are uh, the properties are being bought by, by first-time buyers. It is helping to free up the market, and there is pressure to extend the life of that scheme. And we've also had a number of innovative solutions uh, in terms of increasing the supply of affordable housing, such as the Welsh Housing Bond bringing together um, about 18 Welsh housing associations, as well as a, a local initiative from Wonderkin and TAF, RCT Homes, um, together with a, an organisation called Bellerathon. Where again, they're looking to develop affordable housing um, above social rents, but not at the sort of rent levels that John was talking about in England again, specifically on schemes in Cardiff and Rundercombe and Taff. Just very quickly to say something about the, the policies on affordable non-market housing. As I said at the beginning, this sector is relatively modest in, in Wales, around about 16%. Um, there's been no suggestion, as there has been in England, of revitalising the right to buy. Indeed, um, start of this year, again, the current minister has announced a review, I believe with the expectation that that will lead to a scrapping of the right to buy in Wales. It's already been suspended in one Welsh local authority, um, so we, we may. It's a bit sort of um, shutting the stable door after the horse has bolted, but nonetheless, I think a welcome development. Uh, we have had targets both under the last Welsh government for increasing the supply of affordable housing. Um, in Wales with a target uh, of 6,500 in the period 2007 to 11, which was uh, exceeded um, a year ahead of schedule. 
we currently have a target of 10,000. Again, 70% of that has been achieved uh, already, so I'm sure it will be exceeded. Um, so, encouraging progress, but I think when you set them against uh, the sort of evidence of need both for affordable and market housing, uh, there is no room for, for complacency. Um, I think there is potential for beginning to increase local authority housing um, in Wales. The 11 local authorities that still have council housing will have more freedom from April uh, to, to borrow and invest in the provision of, um, of rented housing again. And there probably is potential still for the housing association sector not to go down the, uh, the English Homes and Communities Agency model of um, non-affordable affordable housing at 80% market rents, but perhaps to think about the balance between social renting and intermediate renting. So, some prospects there. Um, as I say, I don't feel expert enough to say a great deal about the land use planning and um, issues around housing standards, but again, uh, I think some of the reports, the Essex report and the uh, the Housing Supply Task Report from last year have talked about the need for bringing forward more public land. They've talked about the need to give greater clarity within the LDP process. There is, I think, a real problem about a, a disconnect between local planning policy and very often the lack now of a, a clear local housing strategy in many local authorities. The evidence that we have is probably a variable local authority performance in terms of the extent to which planning obligations for the supply of affordable housing are being delivered. Um, but again, some changes being introduced perhaps in the Planning Wales Bill may help to, to strengthen the, the position there in terms of the contribution that land use planning can make. Let me just then sum up. <coughs> Clearly the situation in Wales is much less pressured than in England, and particularly um, in London and the South East. But there are significant shortfalls, there are significant problems, both in the supply of market housing and of non-market affordable housing. I think as well, we've got affordability problems uh, for some households, particularly those on relatively low incomes and those on benefit dependency. Um, I think at a national level, Wales have recognised the the benefits of investing in housing for the wider economy. I'm not always sure that that's recognised at the local level in all local authorities. It has wider economic benefits as well as benefits in terms of meeting housing needs. John's talked about um, the way in which the private rented sector has expanded. To some extent that's picked up some of the slack um, <coughs> with the decline of social rented housing, but there are issues about quality, about affordability, about security within that sector. Again, some of the changes in terms of the Housing Wales Act that came in last year and some of the changes proposed in the Rented Homes Bill in Wales may help to address that. At the end of the day, I think we still need continued um, stimuli to, to promote housing development in Wales. We will probably need to revise the targets and maybe set targets not just for the affordable housing provision but for um, increasing output across the whole spectrum and to develop stronger local strategies and policies to address these shortfalls. Thanks, Lee. I suspect I've gone on beyond my 10 minutes quite early. <laughs> housing supply in England, if you can't show your ability to deliver within a certain amount of the you have to give it 10% back. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we So thank you both for keeping time, and I know that they both have condensed <laughs> material there to put in what is just over the hour's presentation, but between two speakers, so thank you very much for seeing. Um, in speaking to our speakers earlier, we wanted to ensure that the debate here doesn't quickly get into very, very local issues. Uh, so we wanted to ensure that uh, we did address the general themes and issues as well. So if you do have any uh, questions specifically on Cardiff's LDP or the Bale for Morgan, you can hold back a little bit. Uh, I'll give you a chance to come in, uh, but I'll signal when we come, we'll bring in those particular local issues. Um, so I'll chair it initially around uh, the general issues of housing supply, solutions to it, uh, consequences of other supply, and take your questions and comments. If you indicate that you would like to ask a question or make a comment, then 
just raise your hand and I'll try and bring you in in sequence as best I can. Okay? So, uh, anyone initially like to ask a question or make a comment in relation to the presentation? Okay, so, maybe. Uh, don't wait until the ladies finish, I'll, I'll bring you in in sequence. So, if you do want to ask, raise your hand, get my attention. Can I just ask a very simple question? How do you, de how do you define affordability and how does it vary in the different areas? Mm. That's a very good question. <laughs> I, su I suppose there's been a kind of, the old 30% rule is a kind of, um, has long been a touchstone in terms of saying, well, um, you don't want to spend any more than 30% of your income on housing because you're going to need the other 70% for energy, for um, food, for um, all the consumer goods and, and everything else. So I think that's really where the affordable, um, the origin of the 30% rule comes in. Um, and um, the new issue of affordability is directly related to uh, the market rent. So it's now a question of not uh, how much of your household income is it, but how much is it of um, the market rent so instead of being determined in a sense, socially determined by the household, it is now externally determined by the housing market. And that is really where the crunch is, is coming. Because a long-term shortage of housing has driven the price up, as, as we've seen. And now, um, you know, the affordable rent, well, Boris thinks it's 69%, not, not 30%. It's a good question. It's one of those things you think, oh my God, I should have, should have researched that. <laughs> okay, uh, got a gentleman at the back. Um, this is a question mainly for John, I think. Um, if I've understood you correctly, John, you seem to be saying that you think that Wales needs the equivalent of the HCA. If that's correct, what would you see that agency doing? Well, I... Let me, let me put it this way. I don't think they need an HCA necessarily, but they need some kind of central government funded body to step in and uh, provide key infrastructure in, in many cases, I think. Uh, I can think of lots of examples of this. Sometimes it's a bridge, sometimes it's a bit of, uh, it's a, 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 ro a bit of the road network. Um, sometimes it's... Um, uh, public, you know, public transport provision. Uh, in fact, quite a lot of the time it's public transport provision. But it could also be um, uh, other, other elements in terms of, for example, um, areas which are very hilly or very high landscape quality. You might want to make you know, significant reservations of, of land to protect the kind of, to, to develop the green infrastructure, if you like. And flooding areas, of course, are flood defenses. Uh, would probably come in, into that. So the HCA does a lot of that kind of work. Um, and uh, it's, a, in a sense, a facilitator of development uh, in situations where there's some kind of blockage. And that blockage, of course, those blockages are going to become much, much more evident uh, from two things. One is the uh, CIL problem, and the second one... Um, is local authority budgets, which, you know, we're selling off the libraries. Um, how are we going to be, we're not going to be pumping money into, um, uh, in, into new infrastructure. It's going to be much more difficult to fund new infrastructure on those, those, issue, those issues. So I think broadly that's, that's the answer. Yeah, the first question was directed to John, but the bulky one. Yeah, can I just go quickly, because of course pre, pre devolution, pre 1999, Wales did have Ticonry housing for Wales, which I suppose, I mean, you have more of a focus than the HCA. The HCA includes what was the housing corporation, the equivalent of Ticonry for England. But, but, but Ticonry, I suppose, I mean, it's hard to believe now, given that wasn't always uh, the most popular organisation at that time. But, but now when one thinks about it, that did, to some extent, provide 
um, a strategic vehicle to think about housing policy in, in Wales. Um, and maybe we, we have lacked that to some extent since since devolution, so we merged into the, um, the Welsh Government in 1999. Um, so previously it had been sort of non-governmental uh, organisation, Quangars, with a, a very specific focus on, on housing delivery. Let's throw the question back to David. You used to work for the WDA, didn't you, David? I did. So yeah. what but was I'm it? I'm not supposed to say so. What, <laughs> <laughs> what was its role in... in it, did it have a... I mean, it obviously had a role in housing provision, or at least in, infra in, in the infrastructure provision that I mentioned, didn't it? Yes, key as you role. say, it was, it was an enabler in terms of infrastructure, mm. but housing wasn't top of its agenda. It yeah. was really an no. economic marketing machine uh, for uh, inward investment and business health and so on. Yeah. So yes, housing wasn't, for reasons I can't remember, housing wasn't top of the... It wasn't top of the agenda, but nonetheless, the WDA was involved in it in, in m many ways. Maybe not on a major scale. Though. Not in the build sense. No. Yeah. Yeah. Only? Okay, I've got, anyone? <coughs> okay, I've got two more questions lined up. Uh, okay, I've um, got the gentleman here, and then the lady at the back then. Okay, so good. Yeah, yeah, can I ask uh, what I hope is not a loaded question um, about housing density? Is there a significant difference between the German and Dutch examples you gave of sustainable urban extensions and our own quaint and rich carbon city? There's, in the Dutch context, there isn't, because you can see that there were 30 to 60 dwelling units per hectare. So that's the kind of range that we're, we're looking at. I mean, Rudlin is looking at 20 to 65. Um, shelter are looking at uh, 60, 65, you know, so uh, they're certainly looking at very, com they're looking at compact development, but they're also recognising that the private market demands space. So you know, I think it's very comparable. Uh, some of the German examples are denser, uh, particularly the Freiburg examples. Uh, but they're also greener, so it's an interesting, um, interesting trade-off, really. Yeah. Well, patient money is um, the specifics of patient money in the context of um, the shelter proposals. Was the church commissioners, you know, uh, a body with a large sum of money to invest, uh, but not necessarily looking for the, the best immediate return, looking for something that would return well over the long term. And it's also kind of money with a stronger sense of social conscience in a sense or social utility so you know i mean it's quite interesting to me that companies like legal and general are 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 sort of talking as if they're much more interested in 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 uh, patient money you know um, significant investments that will pay back in a guaranteed way over a long period of time but don't give dazzling results um, so it's it's that, that body of, of potential investors who, um, you know, we're, we're talking about here. Um, and it would be interesting to look. We, you'd have to do a sort of special study to, to work out who those people might be. Um, but, I mean, there are, there are different, different developers who have different margins, although everybody seems to be moving towards kind of 20% at the moment. The patient money would look something much less than that. Okay, I, I've got three more people wanting to ask questions and then I'll see if there's anything particularly local. Great. So Pauline is our, our next. Um, I'd just like to ask a question that a number of students of mine are doing um, dissertations on or 
think I did, I, which is, given that we've got a demand of about a quarter of a million houses uh, well per annum, what conscious, and that's part of the housing crisis, and we've also got unmet needs, a backlog of unmet needs, how much do you think garden cities, either in your concept through the Wolfson Prize, or in the present government's concept of sort of absolute and vista, what can they actually contribute to meeting that housing crisis or addressing that housing crisis? Because they seem to be quite small amounts of housing compared to the, the sort of demand and need for so, yeah. Would you like to do what they're doing three months in about five minutes? <laughs> <laughs> Well, this is where I start ranting. You know? I mean, not start, continue ranting. I mean, I think Garden Cities is a classic Tory response, really, to the problem. And, you know, they forget that it was um, a socially, you know, very socially driven kind of uh, concept, you know, of sharing, um, of, um, of participation, of lower land prices, you know, um, beneficent landowners, of long-term returns and all those sorts of things. Then I think um, my uh, Eric Pickle's notion of a garden city is, you know, you can see, you can read it in the, in the prospectus, only three pages, but it talks about, you know, um, uh, close to home and uh, lots of green space on your doorstep and and uh, large gardens and grow your own and the, these sorts of things. You know, it's very, it's a kind of very retro concept of, of Garden City. And of course, it is far too small. And it's, I think it's very interesting that almost all the, um, are there, there are nine winners that you can see in, in the Garden City competition. Only two of them have really produced small settlements, of 25 to 30,000. They've all produced sustainable urban extensions by, de by definition really. So um, the concept, I think the concept is, is essentially unworkable by and large. And when you look at Bicester, I mean there are three, there are three new towns which are definite at the moment. Bicester in um, Oxfordshire which is going to be you know another large subdivision attached to a very popular um, shopping mall. Um, the North Stowe is an existing uh, s um, medium sized 40,000 pound, 45,000 um, population project, <coughs> which has been you know, worked by the private sector. Um, so they're all, they're all bigger than the, the kind of, they're all bigger than garden cities. But what the other prize winners all did was to say, we don't want a small garden city, we actually want really the old the, the labor idea in a way of sustainable urban extensions now they should have you know lots of green characteristics green infrastructure is very important um, green space is important green belts are important if they're accessible um, but it's about you know very it's about significant densities and it's about social mix and one of the key things that I think is really important is that most of these um, any garden city will have to have a significant amount of apartment development, which is almost bound to be six, eight stories at least, even in a suburban context, in locations which are highly accessible. So I think that what we, we, we can learn a lot from the interpretation of the, um, of the garden city from those prize-winning entries. They're a lot more sensible than you know, I think the concept that, uh, that, that, that uh, Pickles and, and Co have come up with. And I think the Garden City concept, in a way, in their mind, is so retro as to be irrelevant. Okay, I've, got, I've probably filled up now with the questions that we could possibly fit in and get answered by half past seven. So, uh, Pass my difficult question, or difficult <laughs> questions, over to my colleague. What would you suggest, Bob? Well, uh, thanks, John. And, um, <laughs> I, uh, I think I think the issues are about, um, uh, as both John and I have said, about about 
channeling additional investment into improving the supply. I mean, here in Wales, tried to indicate that I think the Welsh Government has managed to do that to some extent, but it's also constrained, even with new legislative powers, it's still constrained by <coughs> some of the policies that we talked about, for example, you know, changes to, uh, to, to welfare policy, to the, to the housing benefit system. Wales can't do that, so you know, some of those changes will have to come from changes in policy at Western. Um, likewise, you know, the, the allocation of, of resources through the Barnet formula from, uh, from England to Wales is a constraint on what can be done within a Welsh context. But I think many of the other um, <coughs> policy initiatives that John highlighted from his analysis of the, the recent reports um, can be applied in a Welsh context, and I think to some extent are being applied in a Welsh context. The other, the other thing for me, I suppose, is, is taking the sort of the, the policy responses down to the local level, to, to the sub-regional level. And again, I'd argue in Wales that the, the, the whole sort of housing and planning system is much more manageable. We have only got 22 authorities unless, um, unless Lake Nandu has said we've now got less, but um, you know, at, at the moment we've got the 22 local authorities. We've got a relatively modest number of, of players use the word plan in terms of the, the provision of housing. It's, it's easier to, to get a handle on it in a, in a Welsh context. Um, I still get frustrated that in some localities it's difficult perhaps to move forward as, as rapidly as perhaps some of us would like. But I think it is much easier to handle despite the constraints of, of, of working within a Westminster framework um, and despite the, 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 the lack of pushing board as quickly as I would like at some uh, local level. Yeah. In England, it's much more it is, it is more difficult. But I think even in England, they're a, great, they're a very good example. Cambridgeshire stands out particularly. Cambridge and its surrounding, um, pro, uh, surrounding districts has reached an accommodation and has um, taken a more liberal attitude towards the Greenbelt and is very good at uh, financing and developing quite extensive greenfield development, uh, but which is well served by infrastructure. So, you know, and you know, there, there are several other local authorities that, that, um, that come to mind as having solved that problem. But I, I, I suppose I go back to my 20 recommendations, really. And if, if I've really got to stick my neck out, then there's, let's go for the most difficult one, land. The price of land, that's what distinguishes us in most respects from European development. If you can't, uh, you know, if you're paying ridiculous amounts of money, 200 times agricultural value for land, everything's going to be, if not difficult, impossible. And you're not, you know, the thing about the Garden City experiment, the most important thing about the Garden City experiments and, and those documents, they all reduce the land value. They still give the, the farmers, they're not farmers of course, there's huge foreign and, and uh, landed ownership. It's basically a feudal system we have in Britain, you know, of the, of the rural landholders. They, you know, they make huge profits out of land. And that's what makes life difficult for the house builder. The house builder pays, you know, 60, 70, 80 times the, the agricultural value. That just goes on the house, the cost of the housing or it's taken off the cost of design or the cost of infrastructure. So housing land, the land question, you know, which, uh, and the feudal system of land that we have, and the lack of taxation of, of rural land versus urban land is actually the most important thing. I've got two questions. We're gonna take them both now. They have to be very focused, concise questions. So we'll go for, uh, first, and then and very quick response to my if that's possible. Quick yeah. response. <laughs> so, Alan, first. Uh, well, then, Alan, uh, in fact, I mean, I was going back to that first point you made, in a way, which was uh, the price of land. So we answer almost that, that question. Uh, they, uh, then I can make a comment, which is, I mean, in London, it's probably the only city in the world that has this relationship between development and accessibility, public transport accessibility level. But it's an interesting thing, because, I mean, everywhere it's known that if you increase accessibility, if you increase the value of land, so TFL, which is paid by taxpayer, increase the value of land, and the land value, the better land in a way, is kind of like covered by the developer. Yeah. yeah. 
Uh, well, I mean, the, the main difference in the continent that you have mentioned is that doesn't happen. Because, I mean, the way the local authorities do this, they manage the kind of like improvement, they take recover the betterment, and yeah. they kind of distribute that kind of value uh, to the owner. So, yeah. I mean, that's in a way the, the crunch question why is it not I mean, happening in the <coughs> Yeah. Can we take Caroline's question at the same time and then respond to the magic and appropriate and short? Along with the crucial question of land, which you've also raised, um, what, how important do you think it is to address the more cultural aspects of the stigmatisation of social rent? And how, how important do you think that is in addressing housing provision? How, sorry, how important is the... To address the stigmatisation of social rented housing and affordable housing. It, there is a cultural shift required. All the Northern European examples you state are far more comfortable with rental than our obsession yeah. here with both social aspiration and home ownership. And I wonder how far this plays in to these questions alongside the technical questions which may or may not be addressed by corporates or public sector. Yeah. Focus, focus and response from each well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, go on. You, you take stigmatising. Yeah, you do that. Yeah, I mean, if I, if I can pick up on the second question first, and John will pick up on the first question second, if that makes sense. I mean, the, the stigmatisation of, of social housing clearly is a, a major issue. Um, that for, for many people, social housing is seen as the tenure of last resort, even. Uh, for many people <coughs> after the opportunity of going into the private rented sector mm. so that we, we've had um, people preferring to take up tenancies in the, the private rented sector despite it being insecure um, and often at higher rents albeit often covered by housing benefit than moving into what is seen as uh, stigmatised social housing. I think in part that's, you know, that's a that's a historical issue. Um, it reflects the, um, the long-term attitude of, of, of governments to social housing, and particularly public housing and council housing. It reflects the long-term lack of investment, not just in the new provision, but in the, the renewal of that public housing, which to some extent has been um, turned around by bringing the, the remaining social housing up to a decent home standard in England, a lot of housing quarters. But there are still issues about you know, the stigma of living in social housing um, and still, I think, issues which you know, the media don't help in terms of uh, some of the things we see in the, the red top press, some of the things we see on TV programmes about you know, like a caricature of the sorts of um, households who are being housed in the social housing sector. To some extent, the fact that social organisations have broadened out uh, the, the market that they provide housing for by, by moving into the provision of intermediate housing, if you like, not, not the 80% market that John was talking about in a, in, a, in a London context, but to some extent by broadening out the offer uh, that, that social housing agencies are, are providing. So it isn't just about um, social housing for benefit dependent households and those on the lowest incomes may help in some ways to, to, to overcome that, that residualisation. But it's you know, it's countering decades, <coughs> I suppose, in which the sector has been stigmatised, often particularly in, in, in the media. So John for a response to what might put the land question. Um, yeah. I think a bit of a response to, to the prior rental thing. I think I mean clearly there's going to be a massive investment by major financial institutions in private rental. And that, I think, will, will change on, on one level, the, you know, the, rent, the dimension of rental, perhaps. Um, we'll have to see what the financial is. But there will also be much, much higher tenancy um, protection and uh, management and things like that, which will, which will um, alter things. Also, I think, I mean, the other thing is that there's, you know, there's a lot of social housing which is brilliantly designed. And in fact, much of the social housing is a damn sight better than, and, and wins more prizes than, than does the, uh, 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 than, than does private housing. Uh, and it's astonished, pe what Peabody achieved is absolutely astonishing really in terms of, of prize winning. And I think, so that's another thing which changes 
is perhaps changing that. But it, it is a real problem, as you've described. Back to your question. Um, well, I thought the cross, there was a cross-rail levy. And I was going to ask, going to put the question back to you. There is a cross-rail levy on all developments that are going to take place on the, um, in London. It's peanuts, isn't it? It's peanuts. It doesn't relate to the added No. I mean, somebody, there was a little piece in the paper the other day about turning um, uh, Centre Point into apartments uh, and just saying, you know, suddenly it becomes the greatest place because of the Crossrail station. Okay. And, and it's, the money that's being raised by that is unbelievable. And when you think about Crossrail, the subsidy to Crossrail, £2,500 per person in London comes from central government for, tra for, tra for transport. Five pounds per head goes to the northeast. Okay? So London is just getting a massive amount of, of transport investment. That ought to come back through land values. You know, come, ought to come back with, with return, and that would allow a much more better mix of, of development to, to uh, take place in those locations. When you see, I mean, the Hong Kong is uh, one of the examples they manage uh, because they, the transport authority manage what is surrounding. But I mean, you, since they have been, uh, they have been um, uh, privatized because they were so successful, so they didn't privatize. And then they pervert the whole thing. Now they develop just for, they develop the transport just for the sake of developing uh, real estate. <laughs> so it's kind of been completely reversed. Yeah. Of uh, I mean, there's an interesting <coughs> fashion as well in China where. In fact, we have uh, the state on the land, but I mean, the state on the developer as well. It doesn't produce um, <coughs> housing either. So yeah. I mean, yeah. there's a very much political passion, more than a kind yeah, of you like planning question. You really have to build it into the, plan the whole planning system, like, like Toronto does, in terms of you know, transit, land value, density, yeah. so, you know, social, social content, etc. As ever, we've had to curtail our debates. Um, hopefully, you've enjoyed the presentations and the discussion this evening. Just to highlight that, obviously, these are very, very popular events. We've got many more coming up over the next couple of months. Uh, many of them selling out. We don't actually sell anything, but they are selling out. Uh, so if you do enjoy these events, we've got some great things coming up. Uh, please look on our website and register soon, as soon as you can to ensure that you get into those videos. So if we can say a final thank you to our speakers for this evening.